I'm Mike Schlitz, and uh, I have disappointing news. There will be no death by PowerPoint uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, one, I was a grunt, and I realized that people like pictures, and that's how we learn. But we're transitioning. We're transitioning out of the military, so no more pictures. That and I'd had to post a picture of what I used to look like, and I was not nearly as handsome back then as I am now. So those are my reasons. So 14-year Army veteran. Uh, I realized within the, that 14 years, I have a lot of experiences, got to do a lot of things, just like everybody in this room. Whether you've done two years, you've done 20 years, you did 30 years, we all have a story. And uh, typically when I speak to veterans, um, I tend to shy away from telling my story because I realize you all have experiences, you've all been there, you've all done that, and you don't need to hear what I've done or, or seen or been through. But we're talking about transition. And my transition is a little bit different than some other people's transition because my transition involved my injury. I had to figure out, one, how to deal with all of this and how I was going to move on from the military. So I deployed to Iraq in 2006 during the surge when things kind of were at the height of the violence. So if you look at the violence in Iraq, you know, it's a big pyramid. Early on, they really didn't know how to fight us. They found our weakness. They exploited that weakness, and we took more casualties. We had more soldiers killed. And so we answered that by tripling our numbers into country. And what that happened is means more people got killed, more people got injured. And so the Army's program to that was we got to find these IEDs. And we all know there's two ways you find IEDs. Either you find it, you disarm it, keep pushing on with your mission, or it finds you. So halfway through my deployment, I got attached to an engineer unit. And our job was to drive around for 15 hours a day in heavily armored vehicles and look for those IEDs. And we were constantly getting blown up. And fortunate enough, we had heavily armored vehicles and nobody was really getting injured. But the mechanics couldn't turn those vehicles around fast enough. So how did I meet mission as a platoon sergeant? Well, I got, I got to get out on the roads. I'll take a Humvee. Made that Humvee knowing it's the weakest link in the convoy, made it my vehicle, put it in the back. 27 February 2007, standard day, started like any other day. You know, prep the guys, give them the mission, roll out, clearing a dead end road. Took our time going down, coming back up, boom. I can remember hearing that distinct sound in my head. And before I could even say a four letter word, I was smacking into the ground. It was two 155 artillery rounds in a propane tank. When it came up through the vehicle, uh, not only did it you know, just throw shrapnel everywhere, it also sprayed propane everywhere. My gunner in the turret, my medic in the back seat behind the driver were killed instantly and uh, pretty much no, no, no pain felt. My, my youngest uh, of my crew, 21-year-old driver, Corporal Lauren Henry, burned alive inside the vehicle. Couldn't get out. So the vehicle engulfed in flames and. And that, unfortunately, we know he suffered on his last hours and minutes and seconds. For me, when that explosion hit, it twisted the vehicle, allowed my door to come open, and I was thrown. And any time you're ambushed, what are you trying to do? Take a split second, get that battle damage uh, assessment, figure out what's going on. So I paused for just a second, and I could see my vehicle. And I really, at the time, didn't see anything out of the ordinary, you know, nothing really. But what I didn't see was my guys. What do I do? I get up to run towards my vehicle. And as I neared the vehicle, that's when I felt the flames hit me in the face. I realized I was on fire. You know, not much I could do at that point. Got down, started rolling. The intensity got so bad, my muscles locked up. Face down in the dirt. Um, you know, everybody says about their life flashing in front of them. You know, this is what I did wrong. Honestly, I was laying in the dirt, I'm like, I'm going to die in Iraq, laying face down in the dirt. I mean, that's all I could think about on, on top of the immense amount of pain I was going through at the time. And at about that, that time that I had those emotions going through me, I could hear my guys yelling for me. Um, but the pain was so bad that I was like, well, I don't know how far, far away they are. I don't know how, what they can do, if they can even get to me. Before I knew it, they were spraying me with that fire extinguisher. And that, um, I mean, immediately that cooling sensation, like somebody threw an ice blanket on me just relieved all that pain. So that was the physical release I, I felt at that precise moment. Then I had the emotional side. All right, maybe I'm not going to die. 
Maybe I still have that fighting chance. Maybe they can do something for me. Maybe I can continue on. And the guys on the ground did a phenomenal job. We had trained. We had rehearsed. They knew exactly what to do. They got security up. You know, they got the HLZ set up. They started calling up the reports, got me over to, to the HLZ. Before I knew it, medevac was coming in. Got loaded up on the medevac. I remember having a uh, female flight medic. What's your name? What's your social? I know I got my name out, and uh, who knows what number I gave her. They hit me with the drugs, and I was out. Over the next probably four months, I have one memory. I don't know if it was in Baghdad or Lawn Stool or where I finally ended up at Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio of coming off some kind of aircraft, being pushed towards a building, and the people around the gurney. And that's it. And then I out again. And four months later, you know, waking up in ICU in Brook Army, everybody trying to convince me that I'd lost my hands because of the burns. And, you know, it's head to toe, burned 85% of my body, uh, you know, and I, I have vision loss, which was even bad because I had to wear these big goggles that fogged up on me, so I really couldn't see shit then. Um, and I just, I went immediately into denial. Uh, no, 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 I'm not that bad. You know, I, I, I can still do this. And as they kept pushing that stuff, you know, no, these are your limitations. And I think the first time I really realized how injured I was and how much damage I had taken was that first day of physical therapy. They said, today we're going to stand you up. I'm like, screw that, I'm going to walk, I'm going to go down the hallway, I'm going to get a drink. And I stood up and I collapsed. I didn't, even, I could, didn't even have enough strength to take a step. And so, from every day, learning to walk again. You know, today we're going to stand up, tomorrow we're going to take two steps, today we're going to walk to the door, oh, we got to go down the hallway today. And it was a, a learning experience. And at that point, I was like, I am really bad off. If I'm this bad off, there is no way... I'm ever going to lead troops into combat again. My days as a leader is over. And that's psh, right into depression, right into anger, uh, right into just not caring about life. You know, six months in ICU, got moved down to the burn ward. You know, they kept pushing the physical therapy on me. Just, you know, I didn't want to do it. And uh, I got the chance to go up to Fort Drum, New York, and see my guys come home from my... Iraq, and, uh, you know, I was absolutely miserable. I was happy to see my guys. I was happy that they were home. But the thing that bothered me was I was weak. I was still in a wheelchair for the majority of it. You know, I couldn't get up there and, and just horse, horse around with them. You know, I always consider myself the tough guy, the guy that would lead from the front, the platoon sergeant. You know, to have them see me that way was absolutely miserable. So when I flew back to San Antonio a couple of days later, it, it kind of woken up a, a new sense of energy in me to stop feeling sorry for myself, reflect back on our training where, you know, as a ranger, you don't give up, you don't quit, you push on to the objective. And I just, you know, I started walking more, and pretty soon, even though the doctor said I probably wouldn't ever run again, I started jogging and just started pushing myself. And then I was like, okay, well, I'm getting a little bit better. Now what's the next step? What can I possibly do? What... You know, I have no hands. At the time, I had no prosthetics. I'm still generally head-to-toe bandages, and I went right back into depression, right back into feeling sorry for myself, and right back into the suicidal thoughts to the point where every single day I woke up, I, every second of the day, I was figuring out new ways I could off myself. And even though I was so bad then, so no prosthetics, head-to-toe bandages, there wasn't a single thing I could do on a daily basis by myself. Couldn't feed myself, couldn't bathe myself, couldn't dress myself, couldn't get up and just walk across the room by myself. But yet, in that amount of time, I had figured out hundreds of ways that I could off myself, but I couldn't do those other things. And the thing that really probably helped me the most was the community. My brothers and sisters, my fellow veterans, my fellow rangers, my family, they surrounded me. Every time I was going to go off, or I was really never left alone. I always had somebody around me. It was the community that came together. That's what saved my life. Later on, as I was going through my recovery, I finally got some prosthetics. And I can remember the very first night I got home with my first prosthetic, right arm, only the right arm. And I could feed myself. And uh, 
It gave me that little bit of independence, that little bit of hope. I was like, well, damn, I can, I can feed myself now. I wonder what else I can do. And go down the line a little bit further, get my second prosthetic. Well, now not only can I feed myself, but I can dress myself. I can take myself to the bathroom. Maybe I can do some cooking. And it gave me that renewed sense. But I still had no idea what I was going to do with my life. And I remember one time my mother going, well, why don't you become a public speaker? Oh, no, 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 I can't do that. I can't get up in front of people and, and talk. That's, that's just not me. I can't do that. But what I forgot to do is reflect back on my military training. That young sergeant giving classes to, to his team and his squad. That platoon sergeant giving classes to the platoon or briefings. Being a ranger instructor where I had to talk to three to 400 students at a time. Exact same thing. Same thing, different environment. So I came to the rationalization that I'm not going to be a soldier. I'm going to have to find something new. I was still lacking that sense of purpose. And one of the things, you know, at the time I was going to these different events, we've all pretty much seen, you know, the wounded guys going to, you know, scuba trips or hunting trips and, you know, going to sporting events. And most people think those trips are for morale. You know, let's uplift these guys, let, let them know that we haven't forgotten them. But there's another thing that allows those guys to do. Gets them back out in public. Gets them used to being around people again. You know, bringing them out of their, their comfort zone, putting them into situations where, you know, maybe they don't want to be there. They're not happy to be there. And after one or two trips like that, I was like, man, I really enjoy this. I, I enjoy being around the community, but I don't want to come as a participant. If I'm going to come to these events, I'd rather help them put it on let me kind of maybe help mentor some of the others that are a few, few steps behind me. And all of a sudden, like I, I was waking up again, and I just had a renewed sense of, of energy. Well, part of that was is because I was starting to find that sense of purpose. We've heard it over and over throughout the seminar. Sense of purpose, sense of purpose. What is your sense of purpose? Your sense of purpose is that thing that kicks your ass out of bed every day, that not only kicks your ass out of bed, but drives you to get out of bed every day. And for me, from that moment to this moment now, has been giving back to the veteran community to be able to you know, lobby on, on, on uh, Capitol Hill, to reach out to other nonprofits, to reach out to corporations, to raise awareness to whatever I can do for the community. That's what gets me out of bed every day. And everybody's sense of purpose is different. That thing that pulls you out of bed doesn't necessarily have to be grand and, and, and wondrous and, you know, you want to write a book about it. It can be simple. Everybody's sense of purpose. I've met people that their sense of purpose was their career. The majority of my, my early adulthood was my career, was me being a soldier. I loved it. I wanted to go train. I liked the challenges. I liked the routine. I liked the discipline. That was my sense of purpose. And then... It changed. I've met other people that it's not their career. Maybe, you know, their sense of purpose is their family. They wake up every day so they can take care of their family. Pretty good. We're worth getting out of bed every day if you can take care of your family. Then there's some others I've met that it's not. They wake up every day to make money. They like things. They like going on trips. Maybe they want to travel the world. You can't travel the world without making money, so they get up every day and they go make money. If that is what drives you to get out of bed every day, then go for it. But let, you know, oftentimes when I'm at these seminars, I hear two things, sense of purpose and mission. Let me be kind of clear on this. They kind of are similar, but they don't necessarily mean the same thing. So if your sense of purpose is to take care of your family, get you out of bed every day to take care of your family, then your mission might be, to go to work, to make a living, to be able to provide, do things with your family. It can be multiple things. So you might have to kind of separate that thing that pulls you out of bed every day to the thing that makes it happen. Maybe your sense of purpose every day is to get out and just go work out. You want to get physically fit again. You can't just stay home and get physically fit, right? You got to have a mission that provides you that sense of purpose. So I move on 
I start doing these, these nonprofit events. It becomes my sense of purpose. And I just kind of fall into the public speaking. Hey, can you come talk to my nonprofit? Hey, can you come talk to my school? And early on, I, I kind of was like, well, I can start doing this, this speaking thing. You know, maybe I'm a little bit better at it than what I thought I was. So I decided, to, well, if I want to give back to the veteran community, if I want to do this volunteering, if I want to do these things, I actually have to make a living too. So what I did is I started my own business. I made my name my business. I incorporated myself, similar to what the Hollywood actors do. So their name is their business. Everything they do, they get to write it off and, and change things. So every time I go out, every time I go do something, if I talk, if I move around, if, if I help something, I can write that off. So that's, that's how I became into the professional world. I just kind of fell into it. But early on, let me tell you, it, it was a struggle. Just like any other person who's ever started their own business, anybody else in the workforce, early on you have struggles. I had to do so many free events that I was going in the hole. I was actually running up debt left and right. Well, if I want to get some more experience, if I want to become a better speaker, I'm going to have to do some free stuff. Nobody knows who Mike Schlitz is. Mike Schlitz is a nobody. So maybe I go do these three events or four events for free. Maybe somebody there will pass it up. And, and I kind of got lucky that way. And all of a sudden, you know, I was getting hired by Coca-Cola and Gulfstream and Procter and & Gamble. And, and, you know, I've done some stuff on Wall Street. And now I've done some consulting on different levels. But that, early on, complete struggle. So who in here, just by a show of hands, is really scared of transition? Like going, say, from the military into the civilian world, who, who is kind of like apprehensive about it and unsure if they have what it takes to, to get there? Pretty understandable. But let me tell you, you've been trained to transition your complete life. I, how I came to this idea that you've been trained your complete life to transition came from my own injuries. People always ask me, Mike, you know, how long did it take you to recover from your injuries? You know, two years, three years, four years, five years. Man, I'm still transitioning. I'm still recovering. Every day I got to find something, a new way to do something or a new way to adapt something. And then, you know, new technology is going to come out. I'm going to have to figure out a new way to do that. Or, you know, every day there's something for me to learn, a new challenge to accomplish. My recovery is going to go on till the day I die. Bottom line. Well, guess what? Transitioning, same thing. You are going to be transitioning in one shape or another till the day you die. But guess what? You've been doing it since you were an ankle biter. So back when you were still right on your dad's leg and he's kind of walking you around the room, you went from that to going to preschool and kindergarten. I'm not a baby. I'm a big boy, right? I, I'm in kindergarten now. I'm a big boy. Pretty soon you go, well, I'm not a kid. I'm a teenager. You know, give me some space. You go from that, right, that old high school, you know, rebellious, I'm kind of a punk guy. Now maybe you, you go from the, the high school being a student to being a punk to going in the military. Maybe you go on to college. And now, you know, you get to college and you don't have somebody babysitting you every day. You don't have somebody, you know, making sure you go to class or do good. Now if, if, if you don't do what you're supposed to in college, you're going to fail. And not only are you going to fail, you're going to spend a lot of money to fail. Or you went in the military like I did shortly after high school. You go from being that punk, loudmouth kid to being yelled at all the time, right? Doing a lot of push-ups, getting strong. It's a transition. Every step of the way you've gone has been a transition from being a baby to a kid to a teenager to an adult. Everything, every kind of thing you do, you transition. Now we go to the military. You know, maybe you're an officer, maybe you're on a list. But everybody in the room has been promoted at some point, right? Every time you're promoted, what happened? New duties, new responsibilities, right? Things change. You had to adapt. Or maybe you PCS to an, uh, a new unit or a new base. Guess what? You transitioned. You had a change. The principles stay the same. The environment changes. Same thing is going to happen to you now. You know, 
Yes, we like to think, I'm a veteran. This is my identity. You can carry that on to the civilian world. You just have to make small changes because your environment's about to change. So with that, what are some of the key things you want to take from the military going into the civilian world? And this is something I see all the time. Veterans get out and they expect organizations or businesses to come searching them out. I'm a veteran. They're going to come find me. No. No, they're not. No organization is going to come to you. And depending where you're at, if you're more isolated than others, it's going to be even worse. If you're near a military post, maybe you get lucky. But if you're out in the boondocks away from military, away from anybody who even understands, we have all heard there's a disconnect between the military and the civilian world. The further you get away from the military, the bigger that disconnect happens. So what's that mean? You've got to be proactive. What is the thing that your leaders always told you in the military? You've got to take initiative. Right? Initiative is being proactive. That's how you become better. That's how you advance. If you're not staying proactive within your own transition, within your own career change, you're not taking the initiative, and you're going to fail. With that being proactive, what I consider being proactive, what I consider initiative, I, can, I consider an individual task. In the military, we've, we talk team. Team, 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 team. In every successful unit, team, right? But guess what? We forget about the I's. There's no I in team? Bullshit. Because every successful team, there's a whole bunch of I's. Those individual tasks that you have to accomplish. If I wanted to do better in the military, if I wanted to get promoted, I had to outperform the people next to me. If I wanted to go to the next school, I had to prove I was physically and mentally fit to take on that challenge. That's an individual task. Same thing, as you transition, everybody in this room, the people that came out here to speak, the organizations that are here, we are your team. But we're not here to do it for you. We're here to guide you, give you the tools to help you succeed. But ultimately, if you want to succeed, you gotta remember there's individual tasks. That you have to take, stay proactive, that you have to take initiative, that you have to take responsibility for your actions and that nobody's going to do it for you. That is how you're going to become successful. It doesn't matter what realm, what career path you want, if you want to be in sales, if you want to you know, go into hedge funds, whatever it is that you want to do. If you want to be a mechanic, you know, there's always self-improvement to be had. You know, we taught it in the military constantly. There's always room for improvement. As you're going into the civilian world, there's always room for improvement. There's always more you can do. When you think you can sit down and take a break and things are going to now just kind of calm out and be easy, that's when you get complacent, right? What happens when uh, you get complacent? Bad shit happens, right? Don't think you're, you know, I'm going to get out of the military, and I've been going, 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 going for so long. So I think when I get out of the military, I'm going to take six weeks off. I'm going to take six months off, and I'm just going to be a bum. I'm not going to do anything. I've been doing this for 10 years. I've been doing this for eight years. I'm going to do nothing. I'm not going to shave. I'm not going to shower. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to be a bum. What happens to that guy? He goes from that hard-charging, motivated individual to just a few weeks later to the guy who's sitting on the couch drinking beer, playing video games. Now he's unshaven. You know, he's not as motivated. His physical fitness is already starting to deteriorate. We always see that, you know, to get climatized to new weather, it takes about three weeks. You know, when we talk about forming new habits or, or readjusting, it takes about three weeks. So if you think about forming new habits, new routine, and you went from that three weeks out to six months or three months, that hard-charging individual you were when you got out of the military is gone. So now you go for your first interview. Do you think you're, you have the same confidence as when you got out of the military? Do you think you're, you're bringing, bringing your A game into that room if you take six months off and you just, I want to be a bum? I can guarantee you're not. You know, one of the things when, when veterans walk into the room, we can spot each other, right? 
there's a certain level of the way we stand up, the way we carry ourselves, the way we speak, the way we make eye contact. All that says, I'm a veteran, and I'm proud, I'm confident. But if you take too much time off, if you get laxed a little bit too long, you're going to lose that. And then you've got to fight to get it back. I talk about confidence. Because of the injury, if you would have seen me uh, before the 86 surgeries I've had and, and all that other good stuff, I was a fat ass. And not necessarily because you know, of my, all of my own fault. Some of it was my own fault. Um, but surgery after surgery, every week having a surgery, every three weeks having a surgery, you know, not being able to work out, I got freaking fat. I'm 5'6". There's no reason for my ass to be over 200 pounds, period, the end. And the one thing that I always heard was other people saying, it's all right, you got an excuse. They were justifying me being a fat ass. <clears throat> Wrong answer. Just because I got blown up, just because I, I had some situational differences than somebody else next to me, doesn't give me an excuse. Everybody's got it harder. You know, I talk about not comparing injuries, and in here, I'm, I'm going to talk about, well, I'm going to talk about the injuries, but don't compare your success to somebody else's success is kind of the analogy I'm going to get to. I look around the room, and I see somebody who has to have a service dog. Man, I'm glad I don't have to have a service dog. I'm glad I'm not quite to that ability, right? I, you know, don't have to have a service dog. I see Jay in here, and he's, you know, above the knee amputee. Man, I'm glad I don't have... Have, I mean, man, I'm glad I have my legs. Somewhere in the world, there has to be that one individual that just has it worse than everybody. You know, maybe they're just a head. I don't know, <laughs> right? It's just there's a head sitting here, right? That has to be the person who has it worse than everybody else, right? So somehow, you know, maybe using some three-letter agencies, we track that guy down, and it was just a head. And I guarantee if I talk to that person, he's going to say, no, no, no. Somebody has it worse than me. He doesn't know that he's the worst person in the world because somebody always in your mind has it worse. All right? I'm very lucky. My, physical, my injuries are very physical. You know, there's ways for me to ad adapt and overcome things. You know, then you have your psychological is, um, injuries and, you know, your brain injuries and all these other injuries. And to me, like, if I had to compare injuries... I am thankful I don't have that because I can articulate my thoughts. You know, I, I can keep track of my daily activities. You know, I don't have the, those struggles that many of you in this room have. And, and I wish that, you know, there was a way like me where if I need to hold something, I can just adapt the way I do it. And unfortunately, medical science, I don't think we know enough about the brain yet. We don't know. We're still learning, you know. Um, how to, to, to combat, you know, the challenges of the brain. But just remember, even if you have challenges like that, somebody in this room, somebody down the street, somebody around the corner has it a little bit worse. So just be thankful that you're not as bad as them, all right? Don't let it hold you back. Don't let it be the one thing that, that stops you from being successful. Because if you let it stop you from being successful, you're going to go down a long road. If you look at the people who don't have a sense of purpose, who, who don't have the community around them, earlier, you know, we saw the, the tombstone, military grave marker, right? That's what happens. All right? Bad stuff happens when you give up, when you don't strive to be your best every day. You know, one of the things I kind of try to think about in the back of my head, just like I did in the military, is I'm, I represent the veteran community. But not only do I represent the veteran community, I have to represent the disabled veteran community. And though I don't consider myself disabled at all, not even a little bit, I don't call myself a disabled veteran, I call myself a veteran, um, I know other people see me as a disabled veteran. And they ask me, you know, how do you have such a positive attitude you know, why, you know why, why don't we see your bad days? Let me tell you, I have a ton of bad days. The stuff that happens behind closed doors, you know, I'm just like everybody else. I get frustrated, I yell, I scream. 
But when I'm out and about, I don't have a bad day. And one of the, the reasons I don't have a bad day when I'm out in public is people's perception. I travel a lot. I travel all over the U.S. I've been overseas a couple of times. People are always looking at me. And if I go to the small communities where there's no military, I may be the only disabled veteran they ever see. And if I'm hateful, if I'm disgruntled, if I treat people like crap, I'm now the stereotype of all disabled veterans must be angry. They must all be depressing. They must all treat people like crap. I'm not going to be the guy who puts that in their mind. As I was traveling, I was out in L.A. one time. No military in that general area, kind of a, a more well-to-do area. And I'm sitting there, and I'm just having you know, dinner with my friends, having a couple of drinks, you know, laughing, telling jokes. And uh, you know, we're about to get ready to leave. And here comes a, v a veteran in his wheelchair rolling up to the table. You know, didn't even spot him from across the room. And he said, man, I've been watching you for like the last hour. He goes, I, I got injured about three years ago, and uh, I've refused to do the prosthetic work. I've just kind of been staying at home. I haven't really done anything. He goes, I, I, I'll tell you, I'm not living a good life. I'm not doing right by myself. He goes, but I've watched you, man. You're, you're out there with your friends. You're having a good time. You're... You're know, using your prosthetics. You're not just tossing them to the side. I was, I'm calling my prosthetic guy tomorrow. What would have happened if I was in that same restaurant being angry, being disgruntled, maybe treating the waitress like shit? What do you think that veteran would have said? Well, if he's doing it, then I can do it. If he can be that way, then he's going through the same thing as I am, and I have an excuse to be this way. You don't. You never have an excuse to be that way. So when you go out in public, you're, you're a representative of yourself, your community, and those around you. Just remember that, because you don't know who's watching you. When you go into an interview, you don't know if that guy who's interviewing you is a veteran. If he... He's going to look for red flags. If, you, if you're not at your A game, you're not getting hired. Always be a good representative of yourself. Now, I know I kind of took everybody's time from Chow, and we're getting cut because we had a flux of schedule a little bit today. And I could get up here for hours and ramble and, and, and you know, give everybody in the room PTSD. Uh, oh, I mean post-traumatic Schlitz disorder, <laughs> not the other one. Um, so what I'm going to do is, if you have questions, I'm an open book. You know, we're in the veteran community. You can probably guess some of the questions I've been asked, and I always ask them, or I always answer them. So if you have questions, make sure you write them down. I'll be in the, in the uh, discussions later on. Come ask me. But right now, uh, because I didn't do the slides, what I want you to do is grab out your pen and paper, your little pen there, because we're military. We always have them in front of us. I'm going to give you my contact information. And if you don't feel comfortable enough to come to the session later to ask the question, feel free to email me, text me, send up a cluster, and I'll get, the, I'll get it answered. So email, right? Ranger Schlitz, pretty hard, right? Dead giveaway. And I know for some of you Marines in here, that's R-A-N-G-E-R-S-C-H-L-I-T-Z at sign, ding, at gallantfew.org, which, if you don't know how to spell gallant few, there's those things on your table that actually say gallant few. All right, phone number. In case it's a little bit easier for you to text or call, it's 210-216-0024. Anything I can do to help you guys out. This, the people in this room, man, you guys are my sense of purpose. I'm here for you. Not, you, know, you guys aren't here for me. I'm here for you. So whatever I can do to help. Other than that, I'm going to pass it back over, and we'll go get some chow. Thank you.